Hi, welcome to Set Shop Tutorials. This is an exciting day. We've completed four tutorials on still life photography and today we're going to be doing the first of four tutorials on portraiture. We're going to be talking about creating a beauty light first. We're going to be using a hair light that instead of a grid, which is what usually is used, we're going to use a light that I call a scoop. It's made by flexing a fill card between two vertical two by fours. It's going to capture the light and it's going to throw it over the background, which is going to be here, and softly light the back of our model's hair. Secondly, we're going to be using a fill card under the model's face. We're going to be using a hair light today. It's a light that comes from over the top of the background and it lights the subject's hair to, make the, to separate them out from the background. It makes the set look like it has more depth because it creates another layer of lit things. You have the background, then you have the subject that their, their hair is lit, and then you have the front of the subject that's also lit. Traditionally, the way photographers accomplish a hair light is to use a grid. In this instance, we have a 20 degree grid on this light. It changes the reflector's angle from about 95 degrees down to 20 degrees. And therefore, it becomes a, a light that's more useful and that can be aimed more carefully. The problem with a grid light is, number one, it's a hard light, meaning it creates harsh shadows. And number two is, it's not wide enough to really light a group of three or four subjects equally and smoothly. One is always outside of the grid and the other is in the, in the primary lighting area of the grid. To get a more even and softer hair light, I've designed a hair light that I make myself using a mat board, a white mat board, and I flex it between two pieces of two by four lumber that run between the floor and the ceiling. I use a white show card that looks like this and then I flex it into a semi-U and where my fingers are, I use spring clamps to hold it against the two by four floor to ceiling poles. Then I aim a light up into the white surface of the scoop and the light bounces off the inside of the show card and it comes back down on the hair of my subjects but it covers more than one subject at a time and the lighting that it creates is more even. It's a good idea. Maybe you'll find it interesting and helpful for you to do the same thing. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to put a flag on the front side of the light. This will allow the light to hit the scoop, but at the same time it'll stop the light from spilling onto the back of our background. Doing, if it spills onto the back of our background, it'll end up causing a hot spot coming through the paper. We're using a Manfrotto clip and we're going to attach this flag to the Manfrotto clip. The flag is about six inches high and about 24 inches long. Our model today is Elizabeth and here she comes. Hi Elizabeth. Have a seat. Ladies and gentlemen, meet Elizabeth. Elizabeth, meet ladies and gentlemen. What we're going to do now is just before I drop the background, I'm going to turn on the scoop light so that you can see the effect on Elizabeth's hair. Notice the light on her hair. That's what it looks like. All right, now we're going to drop the background. We've now lit 
Elizabeth's face with two equal intensity lights that are equidistant from, Elizabeth, from our subject, Elizabeth. The reason why we want the lights to be of equal power and an equal distance from her face is so that any vertical lines or creases in Elizabeth's skin, vertical lines or creases, have lights on both sides of them. One of the reasons why creases and wrinkles show has to do with the fact that lights create shadows. And if the light is only on one side of a crease or a wrinkle, it creates a shadow on the other side of it. By having a light on either side of Elizabeth's face, we are getting a shadowless light, and those, that lack of shadows is going to make her skin appear more smooth. At the same time, Elizabeth might have a few laugh lines around her eyes and laugh lines around the edges of her mouth, and there could be a shadow under her chin or under her nose or in her eye sockets. We have beneath Elizabeth's face a piece of black velvet. Beneath the black velvet, we have a white fill card. There are two things to know about this white fill card. First off, for the photographers amongst you who shoot brides, at almost every wedding, there's a time, sometime during the day, when you can find a table with a white cloth on it. That white cloth will act the same as our white fill card. Equally true, fashion photographers the world over have known about the trick of putting a white fill card under a model's face. The white fill card under the model's face makes horizontal creases and laugh lines have shadowless light on them. So it smooths out the total tone of what the face looks like. So that you can see the effect that this fill card beneath Elizabeth's face gives you, I am going to pull the black velvet out of the way. One, two, three. Pretty exciting, huh? Hi. We've gone away from the first lighting schematic we used to light the last portrait of Elizabeth. Instead of two umbrellas and a fill card beneath Elizabeth's face, we've kept the fill card beneath Elizabeth's face, but now we've gone to a giant 84-inch Fotex Sunbuster umbrella. It's so big that we need two heads to fill it with light. We also use, are using two cardboard, matte board, uh, flags, barn doors on Manfrotto clips to keep the light from these flash heads from flaring into the lens. We've also added a fill card to Elizabeth's left, which is camera right, and a grid light to throw a splash of light across our background. Finally, the scoop light that we used before to light Elizabeth's hair is still in play. What we're going to do now is we're going to show you how you can take a traditional portrait frame, meaning a vertical portrait, and we're going to stretch it into a horizontal frame. And the reason why we want to do this is because if our final usage of the portrait, of the horizontal portrait, is a computer screen or a video, then it's important that we have to be able to fill either the monitor or the video screen. Come along, we're about to do it. I have a little bit of a rant I want to share with you. Computer designers and software designers have decided to call a horizontal frame a landscape mode, and they've decided to call a vertical frame a portrait mode. Aside from the fact that it's condescending that they think we can't know or we can't understand what the words horizontal and vertical mean, more importantly, it gets in your head that every portrait has to be a vertical. But as a professional photographer, if you're going to be shooting portraits that are going to appear on a computer screen or in a video, you very well have to shoot those portraits in a horizontal mode. So even though we're going to be shooting portraits, they would call the arrangement of our frame the landscape mode. I have one word for them for this. Fooey. Okay. Here's Elizabeth in a 
horizontal frame, but the pose that she's in fits more into a vertical frame. What we're going to do is uh, Elizabeth is going to tilt her body a little to her right, which is the camera left. Good. And then she's going to take her left hand, which is on the right side of the picture, and extend it toward the side of the frame. Now the last thing we're going to do is Elizabeth is going to turn her face a little bit toward the light on the side, to her right, which is camera left. And then the last thing we're going to ask her to do is take a little bit of the pearls and play with the pearls and rotate her hand and just shift your eyes back to the camera. Terrific, Elizabeth. Thank you very much. What we've just done is we've exchanged a vertical portrait and we forced it into a horizontal frame. Okay, we, here's Elizabeth's face and the plane of her face is pretty much parallel to the imaging chip in our camera. But right now Elizabeth is going to lower her chin slightly, just a little bit, and some things have happened to her face when she, when she did that. Her eyes have gotten bigger because they're closer to the lens. Her nose has gotten longer. Her forehead has gotten longer. Her upper lip has gotten shorter and her chin has become less prominent. Now we're gonna ask Elizabeth to raise her chin about a half an inch, a little teeny bit more, perfect. At this point, her chin has become more prominent. Her upper lip has become longer. Her nostrils have become more prominent. Her nose appears shorter. Her eyes have become smaller because they're now further away from the camera. And her forehead has also become smaller. She's got her chin up, and now she's going to lower her chin again, and you can see that everything's going to change. Thank you, Elizabeth. This means that very, very slight changes in the attitude of your subject's face have Drastic, create drastic changes on the elements of the face. There are going to be times when you want to use this to accentuate a weak chin or to enlarge a subject's eyes or to minimize their nostrils. But the idea is, is that you have to carefully look at the subject's face and you have to ask them to raise or lower their chin or turn their face so that we can get the effect that we want. Now, Elizabeth, lower your chin just a little bit, and now hold that for a second and let the people see what that's done to your face, and now raise your chin very slowly and just stop there. Thanks, Elizabeth.